right, so we're in the book of Acts tonight. Our, our series on Wednesday nights is called God Wrote a Book, where we are looking at the miraculous book that God has given us. And by reading this book, we understand God's heart, we understand our condition, and we understand how to fix our broken relationship with God. Uh, so he's given us this book, and it's absolutely fantastic. We've looked at every book from Genesis to John, and uh, tonight we're going to look at the book of Acts. So let's pray. Lord, we bow our hearts before you tonight. We bow our heads. We bow down our will, our lives. We lay it all before you, Lord. God, we want to receive from you tonight. We want to hear what your spirit would say to us. Lord, we don't want to just glean information. We want to experience transformation. So take us from where we're at. Do that work in our lives that only you can do. And bring us to that place that you want us to be. Lord, a place of intimacy with you. A place of love and grace that we would never be lacking in zeal, but that we would keep our spiritual fervor serving you, Lord. Lord, we look to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine if there was no book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans. Ken, if you, if you could pull this mic down just a little bit because it's starting to feed back. Thank you. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans. We'd have a lot of questions, wouldn't we? Who's this Paul guy? Who's Timothy? Where'd they come from? How'd they hear about Jesus? How were their lives changed? How in the world did the gospel make it all the way to Rome? For that matter, how did people in Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, Galatia, Colossae, how'd they hear about the gospel? And what about the Gentiles? How in the world did the gospel penetrate into the Gentile culture? And the book of Acts answers all of these questions. It really serves as a bridge from the gospels to the epistles. It connects the gospels to the epistles and the rest of the New Testament. And the book of Acts, I'm sure many of you have read it, but if you haven't, it's an exciting panoramic look at the expansion of the church the spread of the gospel. It's vibrant and dynamic. And, and I think for us as believers, it's so easy for us to connect with what is happening in Acts because we are still the church and we're, we're very much connected to what happened in Acts. So in Acts chapter 1, it starts with this small group of 120 people. But by the time you get to chapter 28, it's almost a worldwide movement. And so Acts traces the transition of God's working in Israel and the Jewish people to his establishment of a worldwide church that includes all people, all people that believe in Jesus. And so you might say that the Gospels tell us how Jesus came and took on human flesh, took on a human body, while well, Acts tells us how the Holy Spirit came and took on a human body that we call the church. And now the Holy Spirit is moving on this earth, walking to and fro among the people of the, of the earth. It's a demonstration of the Great Commission. You remember the Great Commission, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then in Acts, we see that functionally how it happened and is happening. So Acts was written, as you know, by Luke, Dr. Luke, a physician. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. And he was a Gentile. This is significant because he was the only Gentile, as far as we know, who wrote a book in the New Testament. And as we looked at when we did go through Luke's gospel, that he's a great writer, uh, very educated, very thorough, very well structured and organized. Both Acts and Luke have this similar style, this similar vocabulary. And, and, and it's clear that Luke did his homework. He was a great researcher. He understood the importance of, of eyewitnesses, undoubtedly relied on conversations that he had with Peter and John and Paul and Barnabas. 
and many members of the early church. And both Luke and Acts are written to a man named Theophilus. Theophilus means lover of God. Some speculate that Theophilus was uh, an official with elite status because Luke begins his gospel with uh, the phrase, most excellent Theophilus. And so, so he may have been showing respect for his position. Some have speculated that Luke may have been the personal doctor for Theophilus. Doctors in these days often served individuals. We do know that Luke traveled with Paul. And so when you read a lot about, when you read in Acts and you look at Paul's journeys and all the places that he went, even though Luke's name is not mentioned, uh, we do know that Luke traveled with Paul because many times Acts is written with the word we, not they. We went here, we went there. And so when you read Acts, it starts off like a letter where Paul writes in verse 1, chapter 1, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So it sounds like he's writing this letter to Theophilus. But it doesn't take too long when you get into it that it really seems like this formal document, uh, this historical account. Could it be that Luke realized how important it was to document the growth of of the church. I think that one of Luke's pastimes may have been writing, may have been history, because he's so good at it. Luke directly quotes from the Old Testament about 17 times. That's not including chapter 7. In chapter 7, uh, Stephen is martyred, and Stephen has this big, this very long speech, where, where, uh, which Stephen's speech alone has 55 Old Testament references, Old Testament quotes in it. But Luke, other than that, directly quotes from the OT, the Old Testament, 17 times. Records 18 prayer meetings, 9 revivals, and 18 sermons in the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts. And if you're looking for a favorite book uh, in the New Testament, I'm going to maybe suggest that you consider Acts as one of your favorite books. It's fantastic. So let me share the main idea of what's happening here put this on the screen for you, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the efforts of disciples, the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ spreads throughout the land and churches are born. So that's the main idea. That's what Luke is writing all about. Uh, If if you think of, um, let's see, in, in the end of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 24, you could flip back John interrupts Luke and Acts. If, if it went Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke, it might flow a little bit better because Luke is almost volume one and Acts is volume two. But, but, uh, but if you go to the very end of Luke's gospel in verse or chapter 24, chapter 24, verse 44, These are the words of Jesus after the resurrection. Jesus appears to his disciples in his resurrected body and he says, look at my hands and my feet. It's me. I'm not a ghost. You don't have to be afraid. It's okay. And then he says, do you have anything to eat? Love that question. It's probably one of my favorite questions. Do you have anything to eat? And then verse 42, they give him some broiled fish and and their mouths are probably like, oh my God. Well, we can't say, oh, look at Jesus, it's it's his resurrected body. And they're just like, is that, and he's eating? And they're all just staring at him as he eats some fish, right? It's just, it's a bit comical. And then in verse 44, he says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And these are the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Tanakh the law, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, And then verse 45 says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And then he says, this is what was written, or what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So in verse 46 and 47, Luke writes, this is, this is what I was writing about, how Christ will suffer and rise from the dead. 
And then verse 47 is what he's going to write about in Acts. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happens in Acts. Beginning at Jerusalem, going to all the nations. And then verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. And then verse 49, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, which is the Holy Spirit. But stay in this city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And so that's a little foreshadowing there at the end of Luke's gospel about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the mission of the church, the expansion of God's kingdom, brothers and sisters, that we have connection with. Then if you go back to Acts and you look at verse 8 of chapter 1, this is the key verse. This is the outline of the book of Acts right here. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Listen, do you feel powerless? Do you feel weak? Do you feel like you, you're, you're not connected to God and, and you, you just don't know how to live? Well, it could be that you don't have the Holy Spirit. So often when we feel weak and powerless, we may try to strum up enough power, work a little harder, get up a little earlier. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Because it says you will receive power not when you work a little harder, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see, brother and sister, sometimes we're just lacking the Spirit of God to live in our hearts and to live in our minds. And I pray, if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, open your life up to the Holy Spirit, to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is true that every single Christian, if you're a true Christian, you have the Spirit within you. Bible is very clear on this. If you believe in Jesus the second, the very, very minute that you say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I repent of my sins. Forgive me, God. The very minute you do that, the very second you do that, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. That's what makes you a new Christian. They call it being born again, born of the Spirit. Spirit lives within you. But we're leaky vessels. And the Spirit sometimes leaks out. It doesn't mean we're not saved anymore. The Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit. It talks about being baptized with the Spirit. It talks about walking in the Spirit. These are all similar expressions that we should, we should seek always to be full, filled, repeatedly filled of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And so if you don't have peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, maybe you don't have the Spirit. Maybe you're saved, but maybe you've, what the Bible says, quenched the spirit maybe you've been watching things you shouldn't watch maybe you've been failing to spend time with the lord maybe you haven't been coming to church maybe there's a, a whole host of ways you can quench the spirit getting into what the bible says is the flesh right anger and rage and malice and greed and all of these things right you start practicing and behaving in that way you're going to quench the spirit So maybe you need a fresh work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Now what's interesting, if you look at John, you don't have to go there. You can take my word for it or you can check it out later. In John chapter 20, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And it says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they already had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in them. 
What happens in Acts chapter 1 and 2 is the Holy Spirit comes upon them. It's that filling. It's that baptism. But you know what happens later on in Acts? Acts, uh, I believe it's in chapter 4, where it says, being filled with the Spirit, they spoke the word of God with great boldness. And so even though they were already had the Spirit in them, something happened and they became full of the Spirit maybe a little bit more full or, or a, special, a special anointing, a special empowering for a certain task, a certain mission that God had them to do. So, my faithful brothers and sisters, don't think that you have to be victorious on your own or that you can just try a little bit harder and have enough strength to overcome sin. You need the Holy Spirit. And maybe your application tonight might just be God, fill me with your spirit. Lord, I need your spirit. I've been trying to do life on my own. Forgive me and spirit, come into my life and use me. Now, I've, I've, I've gotten way off of my notes. But I, but I really, honestly, I felt led of the spirit, I believe, to share all of that. Because maybe there's a couple of you tonight that just really need to be reminded that this life is a spirit life. This walk with Christ is a spirit thing. It's a spirit walk. It's not a try harder, work harder walk. Memorize more scripture. We need the spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure who it was. It might have been A.W. Tozer, maybe, that maybe said this. I'm not sure. But he said, in the book of Acts... If you take away the Holy Spirit, 95% of the activity would stop. He said, today, if you take away the Holy Spirit, 95% of the activity would keep on going. May that not be in this church, in my life, and in your life. Let's depend upon the Spirit, rely upon the Spirit, seek the filling of the Spirit every single day minute of the day. So Acts 1.8 is the key verse. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And this is the reason the Holy Spirit comes on us to give us power. Power to be witnesses. It says, you will be my witnesses in, and notice these locations because this is the outline of the book of Acts. In Jerusalem, that's up until chapter 7. Judea and Samaria, it's chapter 8 to 12, and to the ends of the earth, which is chapter 13, to the end of the book. So this is the outline of the book of Acts. So we have the beginning of the church in chapters 1 and 2, then the gospel spreads in Jerusalem, chapters 3 to 7, Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 to 12, and to the ends of the earth, chapter 13 to 28. It's another way to divide the book. Uh, which is kind of fun, and that is based on its two main characters, Peter and Paul. Not Peter, Paul, and Mary, but Peter and Paul. So uh, Peter's leadership is chronicled in chapters 1 to 12, and then it switches to Paul in from chapter 12 to 28. So before we do anything else... Um, I don't know what it says in your Bible, but some Bibles say Acts of the Apostles. If you look at the very beginning up at the top, you ever heard that, Acts of the Apostles? I think that's a bad title. I think it's a bad title because uh, it doesn't really tell us what happened with all the apostles. It's more of the Acts of a couple apostles, not all the apostles. We don't know what happened with uh, Bartholomew or Thomas. It's not chronicled in Scripture. Uh, Luke is tracing the propagation of the gospel into Asia Minor and Europe, but nothing's mentioned about any apostles that may have gone south into Africa or into Babylon or Persia. We really don't know. So I think a better, better, better title would be the Acts of God or the Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the Church or the Here's one title that I propose, The Acts of Jesus Through the Holy Spirit in the Life of the Church and the Spread of the Gospel. But Luke probably thought that was a bit too long, so he just went with Acts, which works for me. All right, there's another cool little parallel here between Peter and Paul. 
that's kind of interesting to look at when you look at, at their lives and put this on a chart for you. So both of them healed a man lame from birth. Uh, Peter did that in Acts chapter 3, Paul in Acts 14. They both performed an exorcism. You have the verses there, Acts 5 and Acts 16. They both uh, miraculously healed. Uh, Peter, his shadow fell on people and they were healed. And Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons that he had touched ended up healing people. That's in uh, Acts uh, 5 and Acts 19, respectively. Uh, both of them were freed from prison. Peter actually was freed from prison twice, once in Acts chapter 5, one in Acts 12, and Paul was freed from prison in Acts chapter 16 when he was in Philippi there. They both encountered a magician. In Acts chapter 8, Peter dealt with a guy named Simon, and then in Acts chapter 13, Paul dealt with a magician named Bar-Jesus. They both raised somebody from the dead. Peter raised a person named Dorcas, and Paul raised a young man in Acts chapter 20. So just some interesting parallels between their lives. Well, what I'd like to do for the rest of our time is point out 12 key events, 12 key events that happened in the book of Acts. This is really hard to do because there's so many amazing events in the book of Acts. So some of these might be more major than others. I may leave out your favorite event. If I do, please accept my apology in advance. Um, but I just picked out 12 that I think are pretty significant here. Uh, and the first one is just simply the beginning, the beginning of the book of Acts. I wanted to read these first 11 verses. I, I think they're significant because they really set the, set the tone here for what's happening, where Paul writes in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. So he, after his resurrection, he appeared many times to prove that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now stop right there. That's verse 3. 40 days, hanging out with Jesus in a resurrected body. And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And I wish we had manuscripts of those conversations. I wish somebody wrote some of that down. What did he say in his resurrected body? Unbelievable. Four, verse four. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, again, <laughs> they're eating. Jesus loved to eat. That's where we inherit it from here at Calvary Chapel. <laughs> On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel. So, you know, this tells me, this verse, that Jesus may have been talking about end times because they're asking him about when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So maybe Jesus said something about the restoration of the kingdom and Israel inheriting the kingdom. So interesting. And verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then the verse that we already read, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This is, this is just really comical. Now Jesus ascends into heaven. And I'm not sure if he floated slowly or if he kind of did a couple backflips and turns and figure eights and just kind of flying like Superman. I mean, I don't know how he did it. 
But I think if any of us were outside and somebody was like floating up into the air, you're like, oh my goodness, you're defying the law of gravity. I mean, it's like, what? That's impossible. And they're watching Jesus and their, their jaws are just dropped to the floor. And then these angels behind them said, why do you stand looking into the sky? And you're like, what do you mean, why do we stand looking into the sky? He's floating <laughs> in the middle of the air. But then again, you're angels, so it's probably not a big deal to you. Then they say, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There it is, right there, the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is a promise. He ascended into heaven. The Bible says he's going to descend from heaven. He's coming back. All right, so that's the beginning of Acts. That's um, a key event. The second key event that I have is the selection of a new apostle. So this is a very interesting passage here, the rest of chapter 1, uh, where the early church, it says that they're gathered together, verse 14, says that they were, they were, uh, they were praying, they were joined together in prayer. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with them. Jesus' brothers were there. Uh, and so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're there in the upper room, all of the, all of the disciples. And then Peter stands up, and he says, verse 16, he says, Brothers, Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, shared in this ministry. A little commentary there about, about Judas. And then, and then Peter says, we need to choose somebody to replace Judas. We're supposed to be 12. We're only 11. So we need to choose somebody. So they propose to two people, Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias. And then they prayed. Verse 24, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry. And uh, they drew lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, who was added to the 11 apostles. So do you think this was a legitimate choice? Do you think this was the way to go about this? So there's, there's a little bit of a debate. It's just an in-house, within-the-church debate. Some say that Matthias was not a legitimate apostle. They say that Matthias was man's choice, and maybe the apostle Paul was God's choice, something like that. I don't know if you ever heard that before. And some people say, listen, we never hear from Matthias again. They should have waited for the Holy Spirit. They should have waited for the Lord to lead them into this, into the, into this choice because this isn't God's choice. But I disagree with that. Uh, and I, I believe that this was, in fact, God's choice. And let me tell you why. So first, uh, and importantly, Scripture recognizes M Matthias as an apostle. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Peter stood up with the 11. So the 11, Matthias is one of those 11. And then in Acts chapter 6, it says, the 12 summoned the whole company. So you have the 12 apostles. So I believe that Matthias was uh, a legitimate apostle because Peter went to Scripture before, he, before they made the choice, he interpreted scripture. They prayed and they sought the Lord in verse 24. And um, they recognized that he was an apostle and it says that he was added. So uh, it's not a super big deal. And the whole argument that we never hear from him again is invalid because you never hear from most of the apostles again. Uh, and so that's just the way the Lord had it. All right, so that's uh, key event number two. Key event number three is Pentecost. Uh, so Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit comes in chapter two. In the Old Testament, Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks. It was a festival that took place 50 days after Passover. It was a harvest celebration, the end of the barley harvest, beginning of the wheat harvest. Great rejoicing. Holy Assembly, and this is the beginning of the church, the harvest, right? The beginning of the church. Luke had written, I'm sending you what my father promised. Stay in the city until the Holy Spirit 
comes upon you until you have power. John chapter 14, verse 17 calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him. He remains with you and will be in you. And so Acts chapter 2, the church is all gathered. The, these are the 120 already mentioned. And then there's this sound like a violent wind. It doesn't say that it was actually a wind. It says it was a sound like a wind filled the house. And then it says that what appeared to be fire, tongues of fire, this is verse 3, what appeared to be fire separated and came to rest. It's almost a picture of there's a big thing that looks like fire and then it separates out and levitates, if you will, or, or goes upon each person there. And then all of the people, it says they were filled, verse 4, filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So there's a very visible, very visible situation happening here, very audible, kind of loud noise, sounds like wind. You see this fire thing that separates and comes to rest. So very sensory-filled experience. They, they began speaking right, in other tongues, and so there, there's a lot going on here. It must have been very loud, pretty loud, because people in the city heard what was happening. They heard all these sounds, and they came together, it says. In verse 6, a crowd came together. They were confused, bewildered. They didn't really know what was going on. Uh, they were amazed because there were verses 9 and 10, nine and ten lists 16 different geographical locations. So there's these many different languages and dialects are uh, being spoken, and there's native listeners there. And the crowd is able to understand what they are saying, even though presumably they're all speaking at the same time. So do you see what's happening? So I don't know if we have 16 people here that each speak a different language, but let's just say we did. We bring you all up here, and we tell you, you know, you speak Spanish, English, Mandarin, Arabic, German, French, Portuguese, Italian, Tagalog, just whatever language, right? And speak very loudly, right, 16 people. And let's say there were 16 different dialects represented out here, 16 different languages that you understood, some of you Mandarin, others, English, etc. It would be really hard with that scenario for you to understand. For you, out of those 16 people that are speaking very loudly, it'd be really hard for you to key in on one. Am I right? It'd be really hard to, like, I think, okay, I think that's Mandarin. I can't, you'd have to get, so obviously, this was beyond the physical realm, right? What's going on here? that there's something of a miraculous event happening here as all of these people are able to understand what's being spoken. What is being spoken is noted in verse 11. It says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God. So in each of these dialects, each of these languages, they're declaring the wonders of God. So do you wonder, like, what is, what is going on? What does this mean? It's exactly what they asked. Verse 12, what does this mean? And so we can guess, or we could just read what Peter said it means. <laughs> and I think that's probably the better, the better option. Some say they've had too much wine. That's what it says in verse 13. Um, made fun of them. And a lot of times when God moves, people make fun of it. Right? So something's happening here, something spiritual. And, and here's how Peter explains it. Peter explains it in verse 17 to 21. He explains it by equating it to the pouring out of God's Spirit, as foretold by the prophet Joel. And I think that's a simple explanation, and I think that's almost all we need. This is just simply God pouring out His Spirit upon people. Um, now, not everything that, that Joel described in his prophecy happens here. For example, it says, verse 17, 
in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. They will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. All right, so not all of that happened here, did it? Sure, God's pouring out his spirit, um, but the sun's not turned to darkness. The moon's not turned to blood. And so not everything that Joel prophesied took place, but it was the beginning of the fulfillment of Joel's prophesy. Everything he spoke will be fulfilled, but not at this moment. And so the essence of this, what's happening, is that God is simply pouring out his spirit. He's pouring out his spirit, and the church is born. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, We were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. And then in Peter's message, his sermon, here in the... the, uh, the bulk of chapter 2. Peter goes on to talk about the evidence of Jesus being the Messiah. He talks about the death, the resurrection, the fulfillment, how Jesus fulfilled prophecy. And I love what it says in verse 37. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Something supernatural is going on. They were cut to the heart. And Peter said, or they said to Peter, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent, repent and be baptized, every one of you. This is how somebody enters into the church. You repent and you're baptized. It's beautiful. 3,000 people that day were added to the church. So you've got an instant mega church. And so who's part of the church? Anyone that believes Jesus is the Messiah the Savior of the world, if they repent, they follow him. When they do that, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within them. All right, and then, and then in, in the, the uh, rest of chapter 2 from verse 42 to 47, you have this wonderful picture of the church and the activity of the church. It's, it's, it's now this church is born. Well, what does it look like? What are they doing? How do they spend their time? What's What's the vibe? What's the culture like in this brand new church? And we see there's baptism. There's this this devotion, like I'm devoting my life to something. Uh, There's the apostles are teaching. They get together to eat. This is all in these verses. They, They had communion together. They prayed together. There's awe. Everyone's filled with awe. Miracles are being done by the apostles. There's generosity. There's joy. It says... They ate their food with glad and sincere hearts, so there's sincerity, and they praised God. Would you not like to be part of this church? People are getting saved. So simple, and yet such a beautiful, beautiful church. Sometimes I think we try to add too much to church. I think all we need is the Holy Spirit. Just get together have joy, sincerity, fellowship, teaching, praising God, and just watch God save people. It's beautiful. I'm a fan of simple. All right, Acts chapter 3, we see Peter and John heal a lame man. Acts chapter 4, they get in trouble for healing a lame man. Uh, Peter has another opportunity to preach in Acts chapter 4, and I love what he says in verse 12. He says, There is salvation. Let me go back a page here. Their salvation is found in no one else, no other name. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And then I love the verse right after that. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, or other translations say uneducated, untrained, it says they were amazed and astonished that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. All right, so Peter. Now, keep in mind, this is 
about seven or eight weeks since he denied Christ. Right? He denied Jesus. He was a coward and he was scared and he forsook his Lord. And now they're observing how bold he is. What's the difference? Well, the resurrection, the spirit. We need the spirit. And they try to silence them. And Peter and John reply in Acts 4, verse 19, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. We're unable to stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. We must obey God rather than men. We will not be silenced. We will not stop talking about the Lord. I love their boldness. And so then they go back to the believers and they pray. And the verse I had mentioned earlier is Acts 4.31. It says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All right, so there's a lot of generosity. We have this case of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, guilty of hypocrisy, lying. They end up dying because of it. So God's showing us how serious sin is, how important purity is. There's a lot of miracles going on. Rulers are filled with jealousy. They're trying to stop what's going on. They throw them in prison. But an angel lets him out. And uh, Acts 5.25 says, Someone came and reported to them, to the religious leaders, Look, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple teaching the people. So think about how they tried to do this with Jesus, right? They tried to stop and silence Jesus. Went even so far as to kill Jesus. And I'm sure after they killed Jesus, could you imagine the Pharisees after they killed Jesus, they went home after that crucifixion, and they're like, finally, we're done with that troublemaker. Finally, it's over. No more. Now we can get back onto our way of life, right? And then he, he resurrected, and now there's like 120 people in the beginning of Acts, right? And now there's 3,000. And the number just keeps growing and growing. And these guys here that are rebuking Peter, they're probably the same ones that killed Jesus. You know what I mean? And so, so they're like, man, we couldn't stop Jesus. And now this thing's just getting out of control. We can't stop it. That's the way it is today, isn't it? As the gospel continues to spread, it can't be stopped. And Acts 5.42 indicates that where it says, day after day, not week after week, but day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. So the teaching, right, the discipleship, the instructions, the proclaiming, the preaching, the evangelism, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. So, so that's like in the church as we gather on the weekends, and then through the week in the houses all over Pinal County, day after day, we continue teaching and proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. All right. Key event number four is the selection of the deacons. So this is, this is probably about five years in. And now the church is uh, continuing to grow. The numbers are increasing. And a complaint arose. There's two different factions of people. There's Greek-speaking Jews and Hebrew-speaking Jews. So we have two different, we could think of them as ethnic groups, two different cultures. Uh, and there's a little bit of controversy, a little bit of, shall we say, racial tension. One group doesn't like the other group. One group is not getting treated fairly when they distribute food. And so this is creating a problem in the church. The Greek-speaking widows were getting overlooked in the food distribution. Look at that. They had a food distribution right there, Acts chapter 6. Pretty cool. Except they did it every day. Did you see that? A daily distribution. It's because the government wasn't taking care of people. The church did it. All right, so this is significant. This is a significant passage because there's this, this tension between these two cultural groups, these two ethnicities, really. 
and it was resolved. And this shows us that the church had to deal with problems, a very real problem, very practical situations going on here. And so the leaders, the apostles, had to determine how are we going to deal with this and what activities are we going to prioritize. Obviously, food ministry is very important. People need to eat. Uh, but they decided that it, it just wasn't the ministry that the 12 would do. So it's not like they came in and said, okay, there's a problem. We're going to come in and we're going to solve the problem. So they decided that the two ministries that they would focus on would be prayer and ministry of the word. Prayer and ministry of the word. So we all know what prayer is, right? Talking with the Lord, communicating with him, seeking God. What was the ministry of the word? Well, think about this. They did not have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. So now they have the Old Testament. They've seen the resurrected Jesus. They've, many of them, or actually all of them, the apostles spent 40 days with the resurrected Jesus. And could you just imagine the ministry of the word as they're pouring through the Old Testament scriptures? with their knowledge of Jesus. And now they're seeing the Old Testament in a whole new light. And now they're bringing that and begin, begin teaching that. In all of Christian history, this group of men, their witness was unique, unrepeatable. They saw Jesus. They saw him die. They saw him resurrected. So, so I'm sure they studied and they prayed. Some of them wrote, didn't they? And then they preached. So this is also a key passage because we see that there's an important ministry here of serving. And uh, these that were chosen, here it says, uh, the 12 gathered all the disciples together. Wouldn't it be right for us to neglect the word and prayer? So verse 3 says, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And so these are the qualifications. Full of the Spirit and wisdom. Now I notice that all of the Christians would have had the Spirit in them but yet the apostles say, pick the ones who are full of the Spirit, right? So there is a difference between just being a Christian with the Spirit in you and being someone who is full of the Spirit. Uh, and and these, this is the qualifications. You want to be used by God, seek to be full of the Spirit. We will turn this responsibility over to them. We'll give our attention to prayer, the ministry of the Word. So everybody liked this idea, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and then Philip, Procurus, Nacaner, Timer, and those guys, all those guys there. And they presented these men to the apostles. They prayed, laid hands on them, and then the result was very successful. The word of God spread. The number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem. Large number of priests became obedient to the faith. All right. Acts chapter 6 and 7, you have Stephen, who was one of the first deacons. He's doing great wonders and signs, eventually faces opposition, leads to his death, triggered this intense persecution, broke out against the church. Believers spread everywhere, and eventually more and more churches are being birthed. And so the next key event is ministry in Samaria. Ministry in Samaria, this is in verse 8. I'm sorry, this is in chapter 8, after this persecution. Samaritans, of course, were half Jews, and uh, those who were scattered, they're preaching Jesus everywhere. Philip goes to Samaria. People start getting saved. There's opposition, obviously, but Philip's doing great signs and miracles. There's much joy at what God's doing, but the church in Jerusalem, here's what's happening down in Samaria. People are getting saved. We better go check this out because up until now, it's only been Jews that are getting saved, and so Peter and John go to Samaria. Uh, they see that the Holy Spirit, uh, well, actually in verse 15, it says, when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They'd simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And so again, this is this is a fantastic passage to show that they were disciples of Jesus. They were baptized by Philip, and Philip was back in Jerusalem. He saw this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and yet when he baptized them, meaning that they were Christians, they still had not received the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The reason why this is so significant is because now the gospel is breaking through racial barriers. 
Now the gospel has gone to a completely different people group. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about racism and racial issues in our culture today. Uh, and we just absolutely need to recognize that the gospel brings different races together. And the gospel um, resolves, or it should, if people have open hearts, we should be able to fellowship and be one with people who have different skin color than us. And if, if you hate people because they have a different skin color, that's just sin. If you judge people because they have a different skin color, that's just sin. And it's the gospel that cleanses sin. And it heals us and it brings races together. I went to Israel many years ago and at a church in Jerusalem, we worship together with people from a Jewish background sitting right next to Palestinians. These two groups that supposedly hate each other, yet in Christ, they're worshiping together. This is the power of the gospel. And so the solution for all of this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, key event number six is the conversion of Saul. So this is a major step now as the gospel comes to the Gentiles. Saul's going to be the one to bring it to the Gentiles in many cases. Chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26 all record his conversion. He is uh, the main key figure now moving into the, the uh, second half of the book of Acts. So Saul's a really interesting guy. He's prepared by God. God providentially made him this way. Hebrew of Hebrews, his resume is there in, in the book of Philippians. He knew the law, so he's able to refute the Jews. Uh, he grew up in Tarsus, so he knew the Greek culture. So he knew both Jewish and Greek culture and language, and he's a Roman citizen. So he had the Roman peace, the Gentile peace, the Greek culture, and the Jewish peace. He was theologically trained under Gamaliel, and he knew a secular trade. So just perfectly fit, perfectly prepared by God to do what God has called him to do. Reminds me that whatever God calls you to do, he perfectly prepares you to do that. So his, uh, his testimony there, uh, his conversion is outlined and uh, documented there in, in chapter 9. It's a fantastic story. Uh, but if you look at chapter 9, verse 31, it says, The church throughout Judea, Ga Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. And so the gospel now has gone Judea, Samaria, Galilee. You see what's happening? It's, it's left Jerusalem, and now it's moving out. It's propagating. All right, the next key event is the conversion of Cornelius. That's in chapter 10, and this is significant because Cornelius is a full-on Gentile. So Cornelius, he, he fears God. He gets this vision from God. This is just all God here. God just providentially did this. He gets this vision from God, sent to Joppa for a man named Peter. So he sends some of his servants to Joppa. Meanwhile, as Peter's there in Joppa, he's up on the rooftop. Uh, pretty sure if I remember the story correctly, he's hungry. He's waiting for them to make some food. And, uh, and, and he gets this vision of a sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of animals, unclean animals. Peter's Jewish. Certain animals you can't eat. And so he gets this vision, and uh, these animals come down, and God tells him, Peter, get up and eat. And Peter says, no, God, <laughs> which you should never say no to God, by the way. But he says, no, Lord, uh, these are not clean animals. And... Uh, and then Peter, or God, replies to him in verse 15. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. So it seems like God just changes the program, right? These animals are no longer unclean, Peter. These are clean animals. You can eat them. What's happening? Well, the Gentiles are not unclean. They're clean. And so... Peter sees this vision three times, and he's thinking about it, like, oh, my goodness, what was that all about? And while he's thinking about it, 
knock, knock, knock. And the Lord speaks to Peter and says, hey, these guys are coming to talk to you. I don't want you to hesitate to go with them. I've sent them. And so as, as Peter's thinking that and hearing that from the Lord, these guys show up and they say, hey, we, we want you to come with us. We have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He's righteous, God-fearing, respected. Will you please come with us? And so Peter goes, and as, as Peter walks in, Cornelius says, hey, God told me to call you, so here we are. Just tell us whatever you want, whatever we're supposed to know. Just tell us. And Peter shares the gospel. The Holy Spirit comes. And now we have Gentiles in the church. Verse 44, as Peter is explaining, everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. There it is. That's the gospel. That's verse 43. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on them. And, uh, and Peter's like, well, if God wants to save him, who am I to say that he can't save him? And so they were baptized. Fantastic. Each one of you here that is not a Jewish person, should be very thankful for Acts chapter 10. It's amazing. All right, the next uh, key event is a call to missions. This is uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, love this passage, Acts chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Interesting, right? Prophets and teachers. If we think about ecclesiology, the structure of churches and leadership, it says there were prophets and teachers, and then it names them Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So this is significant because from here on out now, the, the book of Acts is going to chronicle Paul's missionary journeys. And so... Uh, Paul, at this point, Paul and Barnabas take off on what is often called Paul's first missionary journey. We have a total of three of them in Scripture. And uh, I've got a map for you. I'll show this. I know you can't really see too much of it. But it just gives you an idea of how far he went. He traveled for about a year, traveled about 683 miles, established churches, had both Jews and Gentiles in it. Common occurrence was a lot of Jews would believe, the Jew, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of Gentiles would believe, Jewish people would reject and oppose, often violently. There was also Gentile violence as well. But this is his first missionary journey, so now the gospel's starting to go to the ends of the earth, ends of the earth, a little bit at a time. The next key event is the Jerusalem Council. This is another passage that you should be very thankful for if you're a Gentile here today which we all are, or I think most of us are. Are there any Jewish brothers or sisters here? You are? Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, the, so the, the missionary trip ends now, and, and there's this new teaching that's starting to infiltrate that's saying, okay, all these Gentiles are getting saved. We have to circumcise them. So what's happening? We have to make them Jews. So they have to follow the law. If they're going to believe in Jesus, they have to follow the law. Jesus was Jewish. We're all Jewish. If they're going to be part of our club, part of our group, part of our tribe, they need to be circumcised and follow the law. And so there was some debate. This is a major issue. Uh, Peter and Barnabas and James, or uh, Peter and Barnabas are saying, listen, not even Jews can obey the law. <laughs> How are we going to make these guys try to obey the law? We can't even do it ourselves. So in the end, hallelujah, they decide to not make them get circumcised. But rather, uh, they wrote this letter that you can read there that they sent to the Gentiles. Basically, they say, listen, you want to avoid some things because if you practice these things, they're going to be very, very offensive to Jews. And, uh, and some of them are sinful. And so just don't do that. Otherwise, be blessed. Um, all right, and the principle is that we should be very careful not to put stumbling blocks into other people's new believers, right? We shouldn't put stumbling blocks. You have to do this and this and this and this and this in order to be part of our Christian club. All right, so now the church is growing way beyond Jerusalem, large number of Gentiles. The next key event, just got a couple more here. Acts chapter 16, we have the call into Europe. 
So there's this fantastic disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, and I actually love this passage, Acts chapter 15, 36 to 41. You can check it out. Paul and Barnabas have this really bad fight, and, uh, and so they, they split and they go off two different ways. And, uh, and so now Paul has this guy named Silas and Timothy, and they're led by the Lord to go into Macedonia. So now they're going even farther. Uh, so I've got a map for the second missionary journey, and you can see, if you see the red line, how it's going even farther west now. So now they're into Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, and, uh, and so now churches are being planted even farther. All right, and then the 11th key event, and there's so many great stories in all of these chapters. just encourage you to, to read them. It's really, really exciting. Uh, so the, is Paul's third missionary journey, which is Acts begins in Acts chapter 18. Uh, Paul really was getting addicted to traveling. He really was, he, he just absolutely spent all his time. I don't think he had a home. He just was all over the place. If, if you look at 18 verse 22, it says, when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. So Antioch was pretty much home base. But then, so his second missionary journey ends in verse 22 and his third missionary journey begins in verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. This was his goal, strengthening and encouraging. And that's his third missionary journey. Gets all the way to Corinth, spent a couple years in Ephesus, strengthening, discipling. Uh, and then the last event in the book of Acts is his journey to Rome. Now, he's in Ephesus in chapter 19. Macedonia, Greece, Philippi, uh, chapter 20, says goodbye to the Ephesian elders. When he gets in Jerusalem in chapter 21, he gets arrested. And so from chapter 21, in the middle of the chapter, about verse 27 or so, he gets arrested, and from that point on to the end of the book of Acts, he's a prisoner. So that's what? Seven or eight or nine chapters, he's a prisoner, all of that. And so his witness to all of these different trials, he has all these different trials, gets taken before all these rulers. Uh, in one of his trials, he believes that he's unjustly accused, which he was. And so he appeals to Caesar because he's a Roman citizen, and that was his right. He used his legal right to appeal to Caesar. We can use our legal rights. So he used his legal right to appeal to Caesar, so he gets sent to Rome. It was always his ambition to go to Rome to preach the gospel, but little did he know that the government was going to pay for him to get there. And uh, so he's, he's journey on his journey there on a, on a huge ship, get into a big storm. He counsels them. They don't listen to him. They end up getting shipwrecked. They all almost die on the, on the boat. Uh, but Paul gets to minister to people and serve people, and then he's finally in Rome, and in Acts chapter 28, verse 31, which is the last verse of the book, it says, boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's a bit of an abrupt end. Paul's in Rome, and he's preaching and talking about Christ. Now, I don't know why it ended abruptly, if maybe Luke ended up leaving his company at that point, but I think providentially it ends this way because the book of Acts is still being written today. We are still writing, we are characters in the Acts of the Apostles or in the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the Acts of the Church. And so, all through the book, activity of God, God using people, Holy Spirit working in people, the gospel spreading, everywhere the gospel spreads, you see opposition. This is our activity. This is what's happening today. And so as you go home, as you go about your day tomorrow, the rest of the week, the weekend, whatever God has for you, whatever you're doing, whatever your activity, as you are living out the book of Acts, sharing Jesus, proclaiming Jesus, teaching whatever God has for you, whatever ministry, you're going to endure opposition, but be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit's moving and working. 
And it's a beautiful, beautiful, adventurous life.